What is up, all my unconventional people out there? I had this guy, Trevor, reach out to me about uh, hopping on the podcast, and he's with us today. And he was nice enough for me to have him on his podcast. And that's what Trevor has stumbled upon, is his full-time job is helping people out there get on podcasts, share their message, so that they can increase their reach, their marketing, and that will lead to more clients. So Trevor's here today to chat about his journey there. Also, Trevor and I were chatting a little bit before here how he paid off all his student loans in a year and he is investing aggressively so he can retire faster. So happy to have Trevor on. And I was, when did podcasting you start? Like how long ago was that? And how has things changed in the podcast world since you first started? Because you're on like the ground floor of podcasting that probably not a lot of people know about what you've seen. Yeah, so I got started in podcasting in 2015. And then it was in 2017 where I started the company. So I've been in it for nine years now, almost going on 10 years. So it's it's changed quite a bit. Back when I had started back my own show back in 2015, it was kind of weird to have your own podcast. People didn't really... Not that they didn't accept it, but it wasn't as normal as it is today where a lot of folks have podcasts. It was just this unique thing. People really didn't know what it was about. And when it came to booking guests, I could almost get anyone I wanted on my podcast because it was like a cool thing. Conversely, if I wanted to get myself on a podcast, I could I would have like a 95% success rate because not that many people were doing it. And really, since really the pandemic, I've seen it explode, especially in the industry that I work in, which is specifically folks in the real estate space. Because in 2020, a lot of their speaking gigs had basically gone away. You know, they weren't traveling. So they turned to podcasting. And it was about that time. I don't know really exactly what it was. But within your real estate syndication space, there was a lot of these coaches developing, folks that were successful. And people sort of saw it as easy money, per se, where you could go off. You could buy a multifamily apartment. You could rehab their apartment. And within 18 months, they'll be your money, which is pretty which is pretty unheard of. I mean, I wish I could double my money in 18 months. I'm sure everyone could. So a lot of people got into the real estate space and it really just took the business off. There were so many of these new, what you consider syndicators and operators, folks that were looking to raise capital. And usually people that are listening to podcasts are sophisticated, they're educated, they're looking to learn something. And those are usually the folks that sometimes might be more well off and are going to have money to invest with our clients. So just given what I've seen since 2020, since the pandemic, it's really skyrocketed. So many people have either gone out there and started guesting or having their own podcast. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a crazy experience back way back when I would, I wish I still kept on with my show back in 2015. I think I was getting like a thousand, 2000 downloads an episode and I did 60 episodes. I was like, Oh, I'm not really feeling this anymore. Now looking back, I'm like if I would have kept on it nine years later, could it have been like, I don't know about top 10, but could have been like top 100 because we were getting a good listenership, good good guests. And I sort of think like maybe I could have sold that show at some point. But yeah, it's, it's really just taken off. And I think it's more acceptable now to have a podcast and it's way different than it was, you know, nine years ago. Totally. And when you were first starting out, because I like read somewhere like what most people don't get past like episode like eight or nine on podcasts, mm-hmm. like 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 more than half don't get past that point. How how were you using the podcast to start increasing your viewership? Like, what was that process like? Did you just automatically start getting a thousand people an episode? Did you have like, or did you have to like work a process to start building up for that for people who are looking to get started? Because it's hard when you do a podcast episode, you spend a lot of time on it and uh, you get like no views. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So with that particular podcast that I had started, I had already, I was a partner myself and we had built up our company for about six to 12 months prior. So we had established that. So it's not like we were just going out and launching a podcast without having a separate company. I think if you're going out there and just starting a podcast on your own without any company behind it, any recognition, it's just going to be more difficult for you to grow. And it's just easier if you already have that company built. So for our example, with that company, we were like a motivational based company. And we had about 100,000 Instagram followers. I think we had like 400,000 Facebook followers, which was good but it's very hard to monetize it. People love motivational posts. They'll like and share. But when it comes to selling a book, of course, it's a little bit more difficult. But that's really, we had that audience built up and then we were just we were starting to get good, high quality guests to come onto the show. A lot of these successful seven and eight figure 
entrepreneurs, sort of the ones that were, you would consider influencers, but I didn't really think of them as that. I just thought of them as successful, but now they have probably millions of followers on Instagram themselves. And I think that's really what attracted the audience to us. They looked at our brand. Hey, these guys have a hundred K Instagram followers that we're going to know, like, and trust them, even though I was 19 at the time in college and we weren't making a profit from the business, but from the outside looking in it, it looks successful. And I think that's why people gravitated towards it. And it was just a good quality of the guests that we were getting on the show as well. I'm at the point where I am reaching out to people to be on the show. And some people will always ask like, how many subscribers do you have? How many, you know, listens are you getting? And then other people are like, yeah, this sounds cool. I'll hop on the show. And what's funny to me is what I'm realizing is the people who are like, they have a good following, but they're not like huge are the people asking about the subscribers. Mm -hmm. And then the people that have like the really big followings literally ask the least amount of questions. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, is there anything that you're seeing on like what, 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 what that's about? Yeah, honestly, I see. I think some people, I don't want to say egotistical per se, but that's kind of, that's kind of what it is at the end of the day. They think they want, they, they want to go on the best and biggest podcast. And honestly, like, from the standpoint of my business, the bigger client I work with, the easier to work with. When I work with the smaller client, they have these expectations that I'm talking, they want to go on like the Joe Rogan podcast or the Bigger Pockets podcast. And we're talking someone that's maybe been in real estate two years and has 20 units where I get this guy and he has a billion in assets under management with 5,000 units and he's happy to go on any show that's out there. And I think it just, I don't know, I don't say I don't know what it is, but it got to a point in our business where I didn't want to take on the small small client because they were just they're like a headache to work with whatever reason their demands were so much more than our bigger clients and honestly i don't i don't know why that is i wish i had a better answer for it that's just been my my experience where the people that are a little bit smaller they do have these higher demands than these people that are more successful and again i don't know exactly why but that's definitely been my experience too when i've been running my company yeah i mean your company i mean i looked at it it's pretty affordable i mean you have different packages and i mean the amount of time it takes for someone like me to reach out to random people to try and get on their podcast would probably be at least 10 times the amount of time that it's going to take you to figure this out. Cause like you have like a system and are you able to like share anything about like what that system is without like giving away any secrets or anything like that? Yeah, most well, certainly. So really at this point, because we've niched down to the real estate space, we basically have a database of about a hundred, 150 shows that we have a good partnership with. And then it really just depends on like the client's niche, what's their experience. So say if someone's in the multifamily investing space versus someone that's in the self-storage space, trying to figure out what shows for them to be on. But at the end of the day, we'll build like a database for the client. And out of maybe the 10 shows that we we offer up to them, maybe we can get them booked on four or five out of them just because it's not a 100% success rate. I mean, that would be so easy. You know how easy that would be in my business if I was like, hey, I can get you exactly on these shows. But yeah, just been building up those relationships. The hardest part I found when running the business was early on, we worked with so many different niches, whether it was real estate or entrepreneurship. We worked with a lot of these functional medicine specialists, which is nothing to do with real estate. And every time you do that, you have to establish new relationships with these podcast hosts and you have to find new shows. And it just became like, why do I want to do this? Why not make it so simple when we take on a new client we have these pre-established relationships where we just reach out to the host hey so and so we have a new client here's this one sheet let me know if you want to have them on where it's not even really sending out a cold email pitch and i think that was the big thing for us was just broadening and just going all in on this one specific niche and i also knew too there's a couple of competitors out there that have grown over the years and when i'm on a sales call and someone says why should i work with your company over another company it was kind of hard to answer that. I was like, well, we we send pitches, we get you booked on shows, we schedule your interviews, we create your one sheet. But what exactly makes us different from the other company that's out there? And that's why focusing on this specialized niche is I think what really allowed us to grow because then now we can say, hey, we're the only company that works exclusively with real estate investors. If you're not in real estate, you're probably not a fit for us. You're probably, you know, you probably make sense to work with one of our competitors. Is it the smartest decision? Probably not, especially right now where the real estate space is taking quite a big hit over the last year. But it was just really focusing on that niche and then getting really good connections with those podcast hosts. And anytime we stray away from it, like if we work with folks in the crypto space, it was like a nightmare to work with them. And we work with people in the whole life 
banking space nightmare to work with them it's like we really just got to stay in our lane and yeah we'll work with like a real estate attorney or cpa but it has to be something specific it might be a cost segregation specialist or 1031 specialist or maybe it's an llc specialist specific for real estate investors or a syndication attorney something like that where i'm not trying to get all the clients in the world i'm just trying to stick with the ones that we have and just make it simple for us yeah because i mean you have the relationship so i mean do, are you able to contact the podcast guests podcast hosts uh like directly like you don't have to go through like their assistant and everything you have direct access yeah yep exactly and then even if we do have an assistant we just build that relationship with them and and i don't know i'm not like bribing them per se but i like to send them like a nice like you know gift card if we book a lot of guests on the show to send them like an e-gift card whether that's 50 or 100 bucks just to keep them just to you know you can consider them your gatekeepers just to keep them happy i mean if they're booking five of our clients on their show in a month me sending them a 50 or 100 dollar gift card is going to make their day and make them happy and and make them remember us. And honestly, I do that for our clients that we work with, where we're working directly with their assistant. Like, yeah, the client signed on, but now we're working with their assistant because we want to keep them happy just in case something, let's say it takes a little longer to get them booked or they have an interview with a host that they don't necessarily like. Well, if we get the main person on their team to really like our company, it's going to work out in the end. So I think it's just building those relationships with whether it's the client, the podcast host, or whether that is, say an executive assistant or an assistant, just really having a good connection with them. Totally. And being that you're in real estate for getting real estate professionals on the podcast, what made you decide to choose that industry over others, which you dabbled in, but then you're like, no, we're just, we're just doing real estate. Yeah. I think one, I really enjoyed working with real estate investors and I always liked real estate myself. I went off and got my real estate license while I was in college, never ended up doing anything with it. I thought you needed it to buy real estate. I mean, I, I learned a lot, but a lot of useless information, like how far a smoke detector needs to be from each you know, doorway. So things like that, where it's like, yeah, that might be good to know if I'm selling a house or inspecting a house, but that's not going to help me trying to buy an apartment complex or, or anything like that. So I always had that interest. And then two, it really just came down to the money aspect of it. And it was like, who, who has the money to pay our services? We could keep our services cheap and we could use the entrepreneur at just starting off, or we can make our services a little bit more expensive and work with people that could afford it and work with a little bit less clients. Because early on in the business, we were very cheap and we were taking on like 10, 20 new clients a month. But then it was like a nightmare to work with them. They wanted to go on the, and this goes back to what we were talking about before. They wanted to go on the biggest shows. And then it was funny. Once I started charging a higher price point than when I had been before, it was like, for the most part, the clients have been relatively easy to deal with because I find that if we're charging someone 500 a month versus say 1500 a month to someone paying the 500 a month, that might be their entire marketing budget where someone's paying us 1500. That's just maybe a small percentage of their marketing budget. So it's, it's easier to work with them and who's going to, and who has money. Typically it's going to be, at least for us, it's real estate investors, folks that are going out and finding these deals. There's a lot of money to be made in real estate. And I was like, why not just work with this niche, they have the money to invest in our services. Yeah, some of them might balk at us and say, hey, your prices are too high or I would never pay that. But for the good majority, you know, they don't say that. And that's sort of why I really like the niche. Obviously, I like real estate too, but just the aspect of getting the client to pay our services again. I'd rather have a few clients paying us a, a few thousand dollars each each month than having 20, 30 clients paying us $500 a month. Because at that point, then you got to have a bigger team the more team means more headaches, more, you know, I don't really like managing people <laughs> that much. Our team is, is relatively small. I think we have six uh, people on our team and that's good enough for me. Once you start to get to like 10 to 12 people, then it's almost like you got to go out and hire a manager to manage those people. Then I got to manage the manager. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's not why I got in business. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just stay small, nimble team and work with a good amount of select clients. And yeah, I can maybe, it's almost like what I want to grow the company to, from 500,000 a year to a million, but now I'm doubling the staff. It's like, I don't know if I necessarily want to do that just to make the same amount of money and the same profit margins. Maybe I make a little bit more, but then I have double the headaches because now I'm doubling the client base and more clients equals more headaches at the end of the day and more clients means more team members. So just looking at it from that standpoint. Makes sense. I've, I've met with people who 
are making a lot of money and then they're just like, Josh, it ain't worth it, man. I'm just like crushing myself right now. Just like the amount of work that they have to do. I mean, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes you got to you know, put your hard hat on and put your nose down for like three, six, nine months. But ultimately doing that for three, six, nine years uh, could definitely drain someone um, depending on what you're looking to do. And ultimately having a strong knit team is the best way to build. And then eventually maybe you can find a manager and then that frees you up to do other things. And then you could do it that way. But a lot of people are... um seem like they're in a rush and with like real estate it seems like a lot of people have forgotten that like real estate really hasn't performed very great mm -hmm. over the long haul we've some we've we've been like in a real estate bubble where right place right time like you can get rich being at the right place right time and you, you said you own some real estate so like what are you seeing yeah i think for me it's so for your audience to give them some perspective. So I'm a passive investor. So I'm basically investing in these sponsors and syndicators. So I'm not doing anything active. I'm more or less just writing them a check for 25K. And then I'm owning, you're basically owning shares of it, but it's a very small percentage of it. And then- the way So a real looks, estate investment trust? Yeah, something, or not so much that, but more investing directly like with the sponsors. So they set it up as like a 506B deal, at least for me. So I'm a non-accredited investor. And just to give your audience, some context you have your accredited investors and then you're not accredited basically the difference is accredited you make 200k by your on your own 300k as a household or you have a million dollar net worth excluding your primary residence so i don't fall into that category so i'm five oh so i find those 506b deals and the deals that i invest in are like mortgage notes where i invest in like a mortgage note fund where they're going off and they're basically owner financing people houses to people and then i make a small percentage of that but i mean the percentage i get on that is 9.2 percent annually and i just get a monthly distribution so that's i find it's very stable and secure i invest in a triple net lease deal where you're talking commercial you have your commercial grade a tenants so it's like family dollar dollar general it's a vet office and i think there's three or four properties in the fund and that one's you know pretty simple seven to ten percent annually and then a self-storage development deal and then the other one's multifamily. And that's the one that scares me the most. I got into it. It was me and eight other guys. The minimum was like 50K. We each put in like five or six grand into it. And we just wanted to try out a new sponsor and, you know, put our money into that. And that one's, that one kind of hurts you. We've been, we been getting like four or 5% on our money there, which I would have gotten if I just put in a high yield savings account for the last two years. But for me, like when I'm looking at like these real estate deals right now, I'm just trying to be so protective of my money in any deal that I go into and not that I uh, like, I really just the last two deals I've done, I just put more money into the mortgage notes because it's been good. And I put more money into this triple net lease um, opportunity, which has been good. And I just try to find something that's stable and secure where when it comes to like multifamily, just specifically, it just scares me. Everything that's been going on, it's just been taking a beating in the last little while. And it just put me on the sidelines where I talk to different sponsors, people that are putting together these deals and, asking the questions. And honestly, there's not a lot, of, there's not a lot of people I felt comfortable with, even your asset classes, which seem pretty stable. And I'm seeing it right now through a lot of my investor friends, like investing in ATMs, which had been paying distributions for pretty much seven years, all of a sudden, last quarter, missed their payment. And then now there's ongoing legal battle. And there's a chance people lose their money. I mean, depending on when you put your money in, it might be a little bit loss of capital, it might be, it might be total loss of capital. So it's just really vetting these deals and opportunities. And I think people look at it as easy money because you get these sponsors that come in through these coaches and they know they're going to get an acquisition fee, which is usually one to 2% of the property purchase price. So right then and there, they're getting 60 to a hundred thousand, if not more, once they put the deal, once they put the deal together and finalize it, but then you're like, is this person actually experienced? And that's the scary thing is there's been quite a few people that there's one deal I think it was out in Houston, Texas. It was like $300 million worth of properties foreclosed on. And the guy had been doing it for like a year or two and just over leveraged himself, had variable loans, obviously with interest rates going up that, that crushed him. But, and he was a student of this successful multifamily guy for about a year. And there's been so many students like that, not from this particular guy, but other coaches that have, people just make it seem like it's so simple to make money in real estate where it's, it takes a lot of work, even for me doing this more of your passive investing. Like I'll talk to 
I think I talked to 25 or 30 of different of these people putting together these deals and only invested in four out of the 30 people that I talked to. And I try to just vet them because it's different than in the stock market a little bit where it's obviously illiquid. So if you have to get out of the deal, you would sell your shares, but at a pretty steep discount, which is why most people don't do that. And your money is going to be tied up anywhere from five to seven years. And there's a potential where it's a little bit less regulated than when you're investing in the stock market. So there's more risk for like Ponzi schemes and different things like that. So it's it's definitely more risky. Potentially, you could make more money than the stock market. That doesn't always happen. There's deals where you could 100% loss of capital. And obviously, that could happen in the stock market. But I would feel more confident if I put 50K into Tesla or Google. Yeah, I might lose money. But the, the probability of Google going down to zero and just being wiped out as a company is probably not going to happen unless it's like the next Enron, which don't see happening. So there's definitely a lot more uh, vetting and risk that you have to take a look at when you're investing in real estate. So with these passive deals, do the dividends increase or are they fixed? Uh, so they typically increase um, year over year. So like, as an example, like on the triple net lease, I'm getting 7% and then next year it should be 8%. And then I think it caps out at 10%. On the mortgage note one, that's pretty standard, just 92 over four years. And at the end of four years, I can either keep my money in the deal or I can just pull the capital out. Um, and then same with mul the multifamily and self-storage deal. It should, if, I, if everything goes well, it should increase over time, whether or not that actually happens. My my goal is I, I vetted these people good enough that it's going to go up over time. And just like the first two, first year or two, you're going to make less cash flow and then it should theoretically go up over time if they've been managing it good. Yeah, for sure. So when you get the dollars, what are you, are you doing anything with the dollars? Are you living off the dollars? Tell me, tell us more about yeah, that. Yeah. So I honestly, I have use a high yield savings account. So I just go through, I believe it's Wealthfront and I just have it deposited into that. And then I just save that up to get into that next deal. So any distributions that I get, I just have it in there. And it's nice because I make a little bit more, you know, on the deals just by getting, I think I get 5% through Wealthfront and I just keep my money there and just put the money from the distributions and then put more money that I'm making into it just to accumulate enough to get into that next deal. What's a, you got any deals on your uh, plate that you're considering right now? So I do not. I do not. So I just, uh, well, I should say, so I just put 25K and in back into the triple net lease deal that I was talking about. So I put, that was the first investment I made in October of 22. I put 25K into the deal then, and I really liked it. It's been good. Distributions have been consistent. And what ended up happening was there was a gentleman that was part of the deal and he basically had to sell his shares. Something came up and he owned $300,000 worth of the, he basically put $300,000 in. And then the way that you set up is you're basically buying shares of this LLC. So he was selling it at a 10% discount and the minimum investment was 25K. So basically what I did is I was able to spend 22,500 and get 25,000 worth of shares. So get like a nice increase of $2,500 on it. And it just, it just seemed good to me. And I just wanted to go back and, and reinvest with these people. I, I didn't know it was gonna be an opportunity. I was just sitting idle with this cash just because I was talking to different sponsors and operators. And I just, I wasn't feeling anyone that I was talking to enough. I'm like, I'd rather just sit on the side than just put my money into one of these deals and then have it go belly up and lose 100% of capital. I'm, 100% of capital. So when the opportunity came up to put more money into this deal, which usually shouldn't happen, usually most people want to stay into it and they don't want to take a 10% loss on their money. Um, it just made sense. Might as well just, I like them. They've been good. Communication's been good. Let me reinvest that money with them. But, and it just, it's just scary. I know I keep harboring on multifamily, but I've heard of like a friend who put a hundred K into a multifamily deal and he got a check. He got a check back for 1500 bucks. And that was, that was this whole, that was not a hundred, you know, not a hundred thousand or a hundred one thousand five hundred. Just so what is that? A 98.5% loss on his money. And I'm like, well, when you hear that, it definitely scares you from, uh, from wanting to put any money into but real estate. No did he get any dividends? I don't, I don't know if he ever even did. I think the deal is went belly up from the time <laughs> that he invested with it. And you could see it with the comp with this particular company. And to give you some context, the, the companies that really had a hard time, they would go 80% loan to value. So 80% loan, 20% down. And then they would do, all the times they would use bridge debt into a variable loan. 
So a bridge debt is usually a private money lender. So you're paying eight to ten percent, but it's common because you're doing that because you're going through your rehab in the property. Once the property is rehabbed, then you're refinancing into you're like your standard bank, like Bank of America or Wells Fargo, just a you know one of those different types of banks that's out there. But then they would have the variable rate, and then that would obviously would just crush them because they would rehab the property, thinking rates were going to be four or five percent when they were finally done rehabbing, and then now rates are. I don't know what they are today, but say 7% and just crush them. And so many of these real estate syndicators, that was their business plan was use bridge debt, then a variable rate, and then just rehab the property. And then the the rents sort of compressed. They almost like hit a, where let's say they rents, they projected rents to jump from 1,500 to 2,000 a month, depending on the rehab. Now it can only jump from say 1,500 to 1,600 a month. Then now all of a sudden they're operating at a net at a net loss. And when you're talking about two or 300 unit apartment complex, I don't know what that is, but that seems like you're losing a lot of money every month. And obviously no one can, uh, can withstand that. So you just have to be careful out there. If you're looking into these syndicators and these sponsors, that's the, that's just been the biggest thing for me. And I like to still continue to put my money into the stock market. Cause I'm like, I don't want to be a hundred percent in the stock market. I don't want to be a hundred percent in real estate. If I could find like a nice sort of mix between the two of them. That's sort of how I like to have my portfolio. Price you pay matters. So if there's an opportunity and you have money, like no matter what asset class it is, you have to be adaptable. Like mm -hmm. some, and I find like most people are in real estate. Like I only do real estate. I'm never doing, you know, investing in the markets. I'm only a real estate person. And I'm just like, well, in like 2022, when interest rates were going up and, everything became very cheap. Like Google was trading at like 15 times earnings, which is like very cheap for Google. And you have these opportunities that to take advantage of. And uh, I don't know what's happening in home building. I saw that Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett sold their entire stake in DR Horton. And I couldn't figure out why. But then like that stock also like popped this year a good bit recently. But like for the year, it's like, done okay probably better than the market so like i don't know like I, I i was trying to figure out like why he was selling a company like that because all of the numbers look good on the their financials and i haven't i wasn't able to figure it out you have any insight on what's happening no all i know is if he's making a move i'm gonna respect it <laughs> and i feel like he's probably seen something that that i'm not seeing that's out there yeah me neither like i couldn't figure it out like i was like all right like you know, when I when I look at companies, I'm like, what's their price to earnings ratio? What's their earnings per share? You know, where are they trading at? You know, are there is there anything that's going on? Any potential headwinds? Which I guess real real estate and interest rates. Uh, I think I think mortgage brokers. A lot of people went out of business in the mortgage industry, probably. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, but they made a lot of money. You know, leading up to them when basically they, all they had to do is get someone on the phone. It's like, yeah, I got a rate here. It's like two and a half. Like it just sells itself. Um, so, I mean, ultimately though, like with the dollars that you're getting, like uh, it, I read the book um, by Philip Fisher, like common stocks and uncommon profits. And basically like the idea is like, you're getting these dividends, they're in dollars, right? And those dollars are being depreciated. So like, then you got to figure out what to do with those dollars. So that way you're not losing your, dollars to inflation and getting it eaten up so like you're putting in the high yield savings account is the idea to just build that up and look for the next opportunity in real estate or investment markets or basically anywhere like do you have a process or anything like that yeah so the way that i structure it is i uh basically i'll go through the beginning of the year i max out my roth ira get that taken care of and then throughout the year i'll invest in like my own 401k and I usually try to put like um usually about like whatever I usually do like whatever it is out there I don't know what it is now 22 or 5 or 23 so I use, I like to do that through my company so I get those two and then whatever excess dollars I have that's what I put into real estate so I try to sort of max those two out Roth IRA I try to do within the first two to three months of the year and then the 401k I try to do honestly probably about September this year. And then I'll, whatever the remaining capital I have, I'll just throw into the real estate deal. I'll throw into the high yield savings account. And maybe I'll put in some money throughout the year too into the real estate, just in case I see something that comes up. But I always want to make sure I'm maxing out Roth, maxing out the 401k for me. And then the rest is what I want to invest in real estate. And that's sort of the strategy 
that I like to use is just making it simple where I'm not all in on real estate. I'm not all in on the stock market where I get those benefits of, for me, I like using like a Roth 401k and a Roth IRA, knowing once I'm old enough, I could get those, the money coming out tax-free. I know some people might, would rather put it in right now and then get the taxes later on. And, and that whole debate, at least for me, that's just been my preference. I'd rather just put it in and not worry about it later. Yeah. And then use the other money that I have coming in just to invest in real estate. And that's sort of just been my strategy and, and how I'd like to, you know, just keep it simple for myself. Have you ever considered like opening up an individual account and putting investments in there and borrowing against it to purchase real estate? I have not. I think I have not. The thing that I went down the rabbit hole, I never ended up pulling the trigger. It was like, it was like whole life insurance. I know people talk about that. I never ended up doing that. I just had a hard, it's a big thing in real estate and talked to a lot of real estate investors and they're gung ho about it. For me, I, I went through the whole process. Never, yeah, never ended up. I can see you shaking your head. I, it, I just whole life insurance is a, uh, in my my humble thoughts and opinions, a legal scam. Yeah, I just had a hard the, the thing that I got I the hard time that I had is the lady was like <laughs> the lady the woman that I was working with she was like you can pay if you put whatever three four thousand a month into this policy you can pay your mortgage off in seven years but you're taking a loan against your policy but I still have to pay back that loan. And it just didn't like make sense. I was like, I'd rather just go and pay my mortgage off. I feel like I'm paying like double what I should be paying. And then plus, like if I put in say 20,000 this year and let's say I put 20,000 in over the next five years, the cash value might be a hundred thousand after five years. I didn't make any return on that money over five years. So I'm like, that's kind of dumb where I could be missing out on all these gains within the market. So for me, I just, yeah, it was, and I was like, I don't want to be locked into like two or 3,000 a month. I'm just going to go and I got like, a $500,000 policy for myself for 20 years for 30 bucks a month. And my wife, my wife's in better health. So she, hers was like 120 for the year. It was like 10 bucks a month. Cause it was, it was pretty cheap. And I was like, I'd rather just take the extra, you know, $1,970 that I'm saving and put it into, put it into investments and putting in this whole life policy. Yeah. Cause in the insurance space, people were like, well, if something happens to you, will your family be taken care of? And I'm just like, I actually went to school for actuarial science. So like, those are the people who actually compute the numbers. So the insurance company never loses. So like 99% of term policies never pay out. So that's a good return for the insurance companies, mm -hmm. but it does protect yourself on a cheap budget. I mean, it's like 30 bucks a month just to give you the peace of mind, which I couldn't yeah. completely understand. Um, but what I've been seeing is uh, I had a client come to me, ask me about a, um, all all in one mortgage. Have you heard of these? I have not. So basically the selling point was like, hey, if you like put your money into this all in one mortgage, you can pay off your mortgage faster and then you can like tap into the equity. So it's almost, I looked at it as like a whole life insurance product for mortgages. And he was like asking me about it. He goes You're like, yeah, I want to like save money on interest. And I was like, well, uh, you are in a very high tax bracket. So actually it makes sense to have a big mortgage because all of your interest you can itemize. So it's going to save you this much money on your taxes each year. And that's going to help you get this much money back on your taxes. Now you, with that tax return, you can take that and put that towards principal and then manipulate your mortgage loan to get it paid off in 15 years rather than 30 years without having to be locked into a whole life policy where if you don't pay the three grand every single month, then they, uh, do they just like cancel your policy? I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably something like that. To be honest, I know I was too scared. Did they just take your money or did they give it back? Yeah. That's, see, that's the thing that, is, that I don't know. It, it's that's very easy like, to give them the money, but getting the money back, that's the hard part. Yeah. That's what I imagine the hard part. I mean, yeah. And that's why I just went with the term and and similar to like what you what you were discussing before, like for our mortgage, we have a thirty year mortgage, but we just pay it like a fifteen year mortgage, and it just gives us that flexibility. In case like like a month where we have our you know we have our daughter, and now we have like a couple thousand dollar hospital bill, and it's like well that goes the extra money for the month. You know we can pause it, but it's nice giving us that flexibility to pay the thirty year mortgage as if it's fifteen, just in case we have a month or two, and we get like like our tax ref or we don't get so much tax refunds. We get like uh. It's more Credits. like property tax refunds. It's it's interesting. So we might get that and in, in the state of New York, and we might get like thousand fifteen hundred, and we'll just take that and just put that right back on uh right back on the uh on the mortgage and just make it you know put it right back on the principal and 
and try to knock it down and just do it that way. But yeah, it's interesting. We pay, it's crazy where I am. The property taxes are cheap. It's like 2,500 bucks a year. And it, but then we have a school tax and that's where it hits you. It's like 5,000 a year. And that's, that's really where they, uh, where they get you. But I mean, it makes sense because I'm more in a rural area and there's not as many big corporations. So they have to find money to pay for the school. And we have a good school district and whatnot, but uh, yeah, but it is nice at least getting that refund, you know, and you never know when it's going to come. It just shows up randomly throughout the year. Yeah, it was so weird when I got a tax refund. They they delayed my refund because they wanted the IRS wanted extra time to review my return. And then I finally got the check. And then it was funny when I went to go deposit the check. They the the bank like had to <laughs> verify it. I was like, this is from like the government. And then just the other day, I got a check from my bank, from my from the bank. And then they gave me the check and I deposited it back into the same bank and they still put a hold on it. <laughs> I was like, literally the money did not move at all. And then like, they still have all, like all these holds and everything. So, but, um, so Trevor's doing it all. He's got podcasting you. That's the name of your podcast too, isn't it? Uh, so the podcast is RI marketing secrets. All right. So he's in the real estate game. He's in the podcast game. He's, he sounds like he's dabbling in the markets. How did you feel about the drop this week? Did you scoop anything up? I I I wish I just had more money. I was like, I just did that real estate deal like two weeks ago. So like all the cash I had is, you know, the investable cash outside of like the savings is it's pretty dried up. And I, was, I really wanted to get it on Monday. And then obviously the market, I don't know what it is say, but I know it bounced back over the last couple of days. But yeah, no, I not so much for my dad, but like, cause he's, you know, he's nearing the retirement age. But for me, like when the market drops, I'm like, oh, sweet. I can go in and I, I just make it simple. I don't have enough time to go through and pick individual stocks. So I just go through the total stock market index fund. I find that's where it works for me. And I wish I could just throw more money at it because I'm like, oh, stocks are on sale today. So, but yeah, I wish I could have scooped up. I wish I could, could have scooped up uh, some more shares of that uh, on Monday when everything uh, seemed to come crashing down. Cause I'm like, you just look at the hundred year history, 40 year history. It's going to go up over time, even if you have these these down periods. And I expect there's probably going to be more drops this year and more upswings, just given an election year where who knows what's going to happen, whether, you know, one candidate they think is going to win and the market goes up, the other candidate, the market's going to go down. But, you know, at the end of the day, you look at the you look at the long track record. Usually it's going to go up consistently over time, even if it has those those drops here and there. Yeah, no one ever knows. Everyone's just guessing for the most part. I mean, everyone thought last election, based on the outcome, it was going to negatively affect everything, and uh, it didn't, because mm -hmm. the president doesn't have a whole lot to do with anything, really. Um, it's just yeah. more of a, I don't know, people like to get angry nowadays. <laughs> um, but awesome, Trevor. This is awesome. You are an entrepreneur doing all sorts of things, supporting your family, supporting yourself. And it seems like you don't have to spend a whole lot of time on all of this, too, so you get a lot of free time to read all those books. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> So thanks for coming on and we'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone.